bottom line. It's what it comes down to in big business. How much did you make? What are your shares worth? And how can you make more? Big businesses have armies of accountants and procurement specialists through which all expenses flow. These people keep a watchful eye on budgets and constantly look for ways to reduce them. Nothing is safe from their scrutiny, including legal services. Companies are skipping over traditional partnerships with big law firms and leaning more on procurement, using alternative legal service providers to rope in costs. According to the 2018 Buying Legal Services survey, companies can save 14.6% of their legal spend through legal procurement. When procurement is well aligned and works in partnership with the in-house law department, companies save 21% on average. For a Fortune 500 company incurring legal fees at 1% of revenues, this savings translates into millions of dollars of incremental earnings. So what does this mean to the legal industry? New models of acquiring legal services and advice are popping up daily, and the traditional referral networks are being disrupted. Is it now a race to the bottom for pricing in order to keep your foot in the corporate door? Or do you need to work harder to provide more value for the dollars you charge? Is competition going to push out the old established firms and make way for newer ways of doing things? Will there be a ripple effect to these changes that will be felt throughout the legal industry? Let's find out. Lawson, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that occurs naturally as a solid, liquid, and gas. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional developments. I am Jake Sanders, the mad scientist of marketing. And with me, as always, is my faithful and properly hunched laboratory assistant, Paul Julius. Paul, what's the cat dragging in today? (laughs) I don't know, Jake. (laughs) I I got nothing for that one. And I think I mixed the metaphors anyway, because... (laughs) Anyway, um, anyway, tell people what's on the show today. On the show today, we break into big law and legal procurement with an article from spendmatters.com. We interview legal procurement guru Sylvia Silverstein and learn how big companies are changing the way they approach legal services. We also discuss the differences between marketing and advertising. And as always, we put Sylvia under the bright lights for 10 questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the hot takes buffet. The article today is from spendmatters.com. It's an epic three-part series on big law by Andrew Carpy. I noticed it was missing the third part, though. There's only the first two parts. Um, So the third part, leave him hanging. Andrew. What happened to Andrew? I think he was like, boom, cliffhanger forever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The forever cliffhanger. I like it. It's a pretty savvy move as a marketer. But it was a really, really good breakdown of how the relationships in between big companies, big multinational companies and their law firms, how that relationship is changing, how legal procurement, alternative legal service providers, um, how they're kind of disrupting that industry. But for me, um, I, I just think that the, no, no, no news here is that everybody's being disrupted. It doesn't matter who your industry is. It's more like a buyer's market, you know, because they're not comparing you to other law firms, they're comparing you to Zappos. They're comparing you to Amazon. Mm. So I think that's that. That's the kind of takeaway that I had here, that businesses don't need a whole big law firm. They just need a few legal eagles. And it's a cost-based decision. Um, I, I was thinking that there's a metaphor here that big laws seem like restaurants and alternative legal service providers are like buffets. And so I think as a marketing paradigm, how does a restaurant compete with someone who can give the, you know, the diner more variety at a cheaper cost? So I I think it's a marketing question. And interestingly enough, Sylvia says that it's a necessity um, for law firms to start thinking of marketing as just a part of their identity. It's not this ancillary thing anymore. So I thought that was interesting that that plays into it later in the interview too. I I was wondering about this and I I didn't really see too much about it, but talking about the, the, the buffet approach, Mm -hmm. um, the, the article talks about big law. So you've you've got big law dealing with big business, Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking fortune 500 companies or whatever. Right. But you know, some of the responsibilities we're talking about here 
are, you know, fee negotiations, hmm. you know, monitoring compliance with agreed engagement terms, stuff like, mm. I mean, very, very specialized corporate things. So yeah. I don't get the impression that this is something where there's going to be thousands of law firms competing. I mean, it's, it's still pretty specialized. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But what's interesting that I think is that because the companies are starting to break down these things into into projects and into costs and stuff like that, it's it's forcing the firms to do the same. So now, like, well, it's much cheaper for us to use e-discovery rather than do discovery ourselves. So mm -hmm. we need to lower, you know, we need to be able to provide the best value for the best cost. Um, it's not always the lowest cost, but that, that so they're having to look at their processes in, in order to make sure that um, they're meeting what the client needs um, in a cost effective way. Right. And and that's why I think it 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 draws a correlation across all industries that everybody is having to focus on their clients because it's their choice. They can move on to someone else. They can find someone else. Like the clients are telling you what they need. So that's the future. And I think this article kind of outlines it pretty well and gives some examples of firms that are actually doing things and businesses that are that are pursuing uh, the alternative legal service provider route. And isn't it interestingly enough that he quoted Sylvia's buying legal counsel inside this article? Uh, she's everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> she, she, is, she is. If you look up anything about legal procurement, uh, you'll you'll find her. I mean, she's that she's there's nobody better to talk to about this stuff, really. Totally agree. And let's head to the interview now. Stay tuned for more goodness from Lawson after this message. I met Tanner, who works for Consult Webs, on a plane on the way back from Key West, Florida. And I'd just been thinking that I needed to do some more marketing for my law firm. So when he told me that he worked for Consult Webs, I was super excited. From the beginning till even now, I've been with them for almost two years. And the experience has really been great. Having Consult Webs on board is really like having your own team of people that really care about what kind of business you're getting. I mean, practicing law can seem kind of lonely. You always are wondering, how am I going to get clients? How am I going to make payroll? But with Consult Webs, it's not just me worrying about having people come in the door. They're there as well. And they've been so responsive. Since I started with Consult Webs, I have increased the number of employees, double at least. And since I started with Consult Webs, the revenue has tripled. So it's really been an incredible experience. Go to consultwebs.com to learn more. And now for a lawsome interview. Sylvia Silverstein is the executive director of Buying Legal Counsel, an international trade organization for legal procurement. Sylvia received her PhD in law firm management from Nottingham Law School, has authored two Harvard Business School case studies on legal procurement. Sylvia also teaches management and lectures at Columbia and Fordham Law Schools. Sylvia has just released the 2018 edition of the Buying Legal Guide, and we are honored that she made room in her schedule for us. Welcome to the show, Sylvia. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I'm, I'm very honored. Well, we are double honored. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a triple honorment to start yes. the show. Um, so explain your trajectory from your lecturing days to your recent work with Buying Legal and give our listeners a brief overview of what legal procurement, um, as, you, as we define it, involves. Sure, happy to. Well, so I originally actually worked on the law firm side, and my thinking was that in order to really help the firm market their services to their clients, I needed to understand what was important to the clients and how they made their, their decisions. So I've been researching purchasing behavior of clients for well over a decade, and I've spoken with many, many in-house counsel, with uh, CFOs, uh, uh, with CEOs, and so on. And around 2010, I discovered legal procurement involved in sourcing legal services. And at first I thought, like, what is that? I'd never spoken with a procurement person until then. But then I researched it in detail and I started to 
organize uh, get-togethers of legal procurement professionals to, to connect them and to uh, give them a chance to share best practices. And uh, then at some point in time, people ask me to, uh, like, when is the next one? When is the next one? So, you know, in September of 2014, we started the Buying Legal Council, which is now, as you said, an international trade organization um, for those tasked with sourcing legal services and uh, with managing supplier relationships. And our members are procurement professionals uh, of uh, Fortune 500 companies and their international equivalents uh, in North America, EMEA, Australia, Asia Pacific, as well as Latin America. And in a nutshell, the Buying Legal Council is really all about education, about networking research, and uh, as well as advocacy. And it's it's our goal to make buyers of legal services really uh, sophisticated in this discipline. And we have monthly webinars for our members uh, um, and organize uh, conferences around the world where we really seek a constructive, a useful dialogue between buyers and sellers. Mm. So when we're talking about client behavior, client purchasing behavior, and lawyers specifically, our audience is mainly lawyers, um, how do you think legal procurement and alternative legal service providers, how do you think those are changing the job market for lawyers today? Are, 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 it's my understanding that these big law jobs where it used to be kind of this rotating door where people would just go in and work really hard and then retire, it seems like big law is disappearing. Do you, do you think it's going the way of the dinosaurs? How is legal procurement changing the job market for lawyers? So I would say that the involvement of procurement definitely changes uh, the nature of the firm-client relationship to some extent. So uh, we see a more process-driven approach, more focused on measurable performance and, and results than perhaps in the past. And for clients today, it really has to make business sense to work with a particular lawyer or a law firm. And as a consequence, lawyers may need to amend the, the way they work, how they integrate technology in their delivery of the services. They need to be prepared to work, as you said, with um, perhaps other alternative providers of legal services and they need to be able to scope uh, their work. They need to be able to put together a budget and, and to deliver the work and, and as well as the results with, within that budget. Um, so to some extent, the involvement of procurement definitely means that lawyers need to become more business and tech savvy. And it may also mean that they have to work more closely with the pricing professionals in their own firms as well as the project managers. Mm. And so in, in regards to big law, I mean, those those kind of stayed and trusted partnerships um, where it's just a giant legal service fee and you're not really sure what's happening. How is that changing? Do, do you see big law firms kind of getting hit um, in the side by legal procurement or what's your thoughts on big law itself? Right. So I wouldn't say that anybody gets a hit in the side because I think that the desires or the demands are very clear and they have been on the horizon since the the uh, recession of 2008 2009 mm. which definitely changed how corporate clients uh, buy legal services and uh, as i mentioned before the group that i'm talking about those are the big companies i don't think that the purchasing behavior of, of medium-sized clients or smaller clients has changed all that much other than ev almost everybody is much more cost conscious and my question uh, invoices or approaches and in general efficiency is uh, something that is expected from from everyone and we did a research I mean we do an annual uh, legal procurement research and, and uh, uh, we asked in the past of how important is uh, project management, for example, uh, for the buyers of legal services. And it was very clear that both for the commodity type work, as well as the high stakes, um, high risk, uh, very complex work, buyers thought that, yes, of course, project management is important because like, how can you manage a multi-year, multi-jurisdictional high stakes litigation, for example, if not uh, with some some sophisticated project management tools and approaches, 
So I think that those are part of the changes that we're definitely seeing. And the law firms, um, you know, it's, it's not like they're hit it, been hit on the side because mm-hmm. th- this has been clear for a while now. And uh, <laughs> now yeah. is really the time to make those changes that we've been all talking about for a while. It's interesting you talk about project management. We talked to other guests before about shifting away from this uh, kind of all-inclusive buffet of legal services to being more project-based. And I'm curious with the with how how that lines up with procurement because it's my understanding, at least, that the old way was that legal services were these these complex risky, uncertain things that you couldn't really budget for, just write them the check and whatever. But now you can, you can look at a project and say, okay, well, we know we have this step. We have to meet this milestone by this time. It's going to cost X amount of time to do this. So does that, does, does, does project management, is that starting to play like a, a, a much larger and significant role? And is that kind of the bridge between um, the, the legal team and the procurement team? I think it's certainly one of the aspects where where legal and procurement uh, can or should collaborate with each other. And when you really look at the development of uh, both the law firm and the client side, we've we've seen a number of different approaches to really say, okay, so what can we do to reduce costs? So, I mean, legal spend management, as you as you know, is a big topic for procurement professionals and. Um, you know, even though, as as you said, I teach uh, law firm management and finance at, at uh, Columbia and, and mm-hmm. uh, Fordham mm-hmm. in the law school, uh, this is not necessarily uh, something that all law students have in their repertoire. That they are um, these uh, super quantitative uh, people who live and breathe Excel. Mm-hmm. So. It is definitely an approach that we see on uh, in the making for a while and. Uh, you said uh, about you know who should be doing the work, which is which is basically the movement from uh, we send you the invoice uh, for services re- rendered one million dollars to an approach where you do task based uh, billing or uh, what's also being developed right now matter based billing, and where you really unbundle the service where you send okay so how can we optimize the allocation of legal resources by engaging third party personnel so why can uh, how and why can we identify distinct legal tasks that that can be separated and and completed individually so like uh, what are the skills and experience uh, level needed to complete a task is that task repeatable and and does it repeat often enough to really justify engaging hmm. a, a, spe- a specific resource what is particularly important to us? You know, does it require a super fast turnaround, uh, particular visibility, or does it have a certain level of risk? So those approaches are, uh, or have become among, and again, I only really speak about the largest corporations. For those, they have definitely changed their approach. And typically the movement comes from the CFO um, and or the CEO or the board. And as you might know, procurement typically does report up to the CFO, not to the GC. That might be for legal procurement, that might be a dotted line to the GC. But yeah. ultimately, procurement reports into the chief financial officer, which that role often has um, a lot, you know, the, right after the CEO, the most clout in, in, any, in any corporation. So this really comes from the highest uh, heights. Totally. Well, and here, here's, here's a question. If... I am one of these multinational companies, and I used to just have a relationship with a law firm, and they handled everything. (laughs) Matter-based stuff, all that task, all that stuff was just inside of the fee. Now, I have 20 different vendors who are specifically helping me with matters and issues. These people just do contract stuff. These people do discovery. These people do all this legal stuff. Here's the question. As from a CFO standpoint, is it better to have a football team of outsourcing people that are now working on 20 different hundred thousand different projects? Or is it better to just have one law firm that handles all that stuff? Because I think legal procurement kind of like, it's like you can get whatever you want, but now you have 
maybe your plate too full because managing all of those streams, making sure those people are giving you good retaining rates or or however, like, d- does this kind of open up a Pandora's box where there was one law firm to deal with? Now there's 20 different small yeah, well, the, the the development is actually typically the other way around. That uh, on average, that the the clients until procurement gets involved work with many many law firms. So this uh, uh, situation about here is one law firm, and the uh, this is our trusted advisor. I've actually never encountered it. I must exist <laughs> somewhere, but I have to, never yeah. <laughs> encountered it. No. So, uh, for example, when we did our our annual legal procurement research uh, in 2017, the average number of uh, law firms was 300 something uh, law firms that, that any large client regularly, that, that means uh, wow. in the last two, three years employed. This year, the number was way lower, but it was still around, I think it was 140 something, um, because last year they had also declared that they wanted to drastically re- reduce the number of law firms that they work with. So this was definitely procurement had it on their agenda and um, they have definitely gone there. And But quite frankly, I think that if you're a large company, I mean, 143 law firms, for example, might still be uh, 100 too many or 120 too many. So, I mean, <laughs> we see a lot of, of convergence where you reduce uh, the number, the, these hundreds of outside counsel firms that support you uh, on a variety of, of, of tasks. So um, you really reduce it uh, drastically in order to really make sure that you can actually have a chance to manage the work and, and your providers, the law firms better, that you avoid uh duplicate work, uh, mm-hmm. that you actually have the purchasing power uh, that that comes from well, we're not sprinkling around all this work everywhere but um we give you law firm x million dollars annually and now mm-hmm. we have become much more important to you so i i see that much more <laughs> rather than here is this one law firm that everybody loved and suddenly procurement comes in and gives you all these alternative providers and nobody knows what to do with them I, that's not really a scenario where i've seen a lot interesting so yeah um Talking about the the 2018 survey, I, I'm curious from the procurement side if there was anything that surprised you in any of those responses. Was there anything where you're like, "Wow, I didn't know they were looking for that," or they were they were hip to that, or you know, or is it what kind of technology or what are, what are we talking about there? Mm. Oh God, what surprised me? Um, well, I would say that uh, procurement definitely has been able in the last few years to uh, show that they can, uh, create value to help their employers, uh, save money. And it's, it's not just really about, uh, just purely about saving dollars or getting lower rates, but, but that they are able to drive more value, um, from, from the firms. I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, something that, that I was very glad to see. So really procurement's impact and, and value realized. What was also nice is that um, procurement and the legal department by and large are getting a long way better, and which is a very good thing because we found that on average um, uh, procurement was able to save uh, 14.6% on outside council spend and when you think about you know that spending's typical range around one percent of revenues that's for a large company that was you know, huge numbers mm-hmm. um and when when procurement worked well with with the legal department those average savings went up to 21 percent so those are things that that i uh, i thought was was uh, definitely significant well we looked at um, all sorts of benchmarks um, as I mentioned before, you know, the number of providers that uh, that they work with, I was I was quite surprised how well they followed up on what they had set out to do in 2017. And it's very interesting, you know, to look at what tools and and tactics they are using and uh, what their goals and, and preferences for the year uh, to come are. So. I think overall, we're definitely seeing on the horizon. And so, again, this is not about ambushing anyone because, you know, people are very clear about that. 
I can tell you the top five goals for uh, legal procurement professionals for 2018 are uh, number one, better capturing and analyzing spent data. So really digging deeper into the numbers. Number two, uh, further reducing legal spend. But please note that it was not the number one, it's the number two uh, goal. The number three, better management of legal work. So this is clearly de de working with the firms, making sure that the, the work, uh, the delivery of the work is better, more efficient, and, um, and hopefully more effective. And the number four, implementing formal strategies and processes. And number five, improving relationships with the, with the law department even, even further. Again, this is not about ambushing. This is really about developing more mature business relationships. And that's the big key that I think everybody should take away. This is about developing well-organized, well-developed business relationships um, with their strategic uh, providers. You know, really, the things you list there aren't, wouldn't be unfamiliar to a, a SaaS, you know, a software company. Or anything like that. It's just that now it seems like these law firms are, are being held to these kind of industry standard things. Like I, you know, we wanted we want more value. We're not mm -hmm. saying we don't want to spend the money, but we're saying we we just need to see the value for that. Absolutely. So the the recession of of two thousand eight two thousand nine definitely changed how corporate clients buy legal services and. I would say the recession really was more of a catalyst rather than the cause. Procurement professionals, in a nutshell, they support the legal departments by bringing a data-driven business process approach to how firms, um, as well as alternative and ancillary legal service providers, are selected and, and how they're managed. You know, often the legal uh, industry is is referred to as the last frontier, or used to be uh, called the last frontier for procurement, because it was really legal it used to be totally um, excused from this uh, in depth cost analysis and professional management exercises that were used in, as you said, in all other parts of an organization. It was always seen as legal work was uh, too risky, too complicated. But yeah, so today legal is no longer exempt in most large corporations with significant legal spend. And interestingly, um, highly regula regulated industries such as big pharma, uh, banks, insurances, as well as um, other highly regulated industries and government agencies, they were the ones who brought in procurement experts first to analyze legal spend and looking at the the um, selection processes and practices. This is a really different world. We're talking about the kind of skills that people, lawyers, kind of coming in. I think there's an animosity to lawyers because they went to school to be one thing and they have to come out being – a something else. Uh, and I think this flattening of expertise roles is kind of happening across industries. Most people have to now be aware of other considerations outside of their skill set. And I think lawyers have a little bit, I think they don't like the fact that they have to be managers or they have to be project managers or they have to learn, uh, you know, lean, agile strategies and stuff. And so Kind of switching into gears about how lawyers are prepared to deal with the new realities that legal procurement is kind of furnishing. You wrote a piece a few years ago that got a lot of attention. It, it, it was titled, I didn't go to law school to become a salesperson. So can you tell us about <laughs> that piece and kind of the connection in between um, kind of that business management and being a lawyer and how those things are kind of synthesizing? Yes, no, happy to. So this this paper, which was published in the Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics, was really an outgrowth uh, from my PhD with Professor Stephen Mason at Nottingham Law School. And there I examined the underlying reasons for the advent of marketing among law firms. And I explored both the barriers as well as the drivers to understand why an industry like the legal profession started to embrace marketing and i looked mm -hmm. at it both from a macro point of view so you know what's happening um economic landscape political technological societal as well as from a micro point of view that is uh what were the particularities of the legal professions the law firms 
and the individual earners. So we have definitely seen a lot of, um, as you know, transformations uh, during the, the past few decades, uh, more so than, than in, the, in the last few centuries, uh, I would say, from deregulation and liberalization, although, I mean, the U.S. is still way more regulated than, than many other jurisdictions, increased clients or consumer expectations, mm -hmm. uh, new technology, and, and the, the increasingly global marketplace. Because of all of that, we have this uh, extremely competitive marketplace. And as you know, services that were once considered highly specialized, uh, so they are treated uh, more like commodities. And most lawyers no longer have the luxury of waiting for business uh, to come to them. And really, uh, the technical competence alone does no longer guarantee you success in winning new business or keeping existing clients. And both in business uh, um, and business school academia, it, it is clear that marketing answers such challenges and that marketing is not only highly recommended, but a necessity to ensure an organization's long-term survival. Marketing is important also for our, our industry uh, because organizations uh, need to be aware of their competition. Uh, the firms need to aim to satisfy their, their clients in order to be successful today. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is particularly true for, for a service industry like, like ours because mm -hmm. uh, we constantly interact directly with, with our clients. And um, as you said, you know, while the rationale for marketing might be unquestionable, uh, we often, at least initially, saw that law firms were resisting the, the diffusion of, of uh, marketing. But I think that that discussion has has come and gone. I, I believe that uh, I, I don't know of any major law firm that does not have a, a marketing or a business development uh, position or department uh, mm -hmm. well established. And mm -hmm. you know, there are people who've had their whole careers in law firm marketing and, and business development. So I think that that discussion <laughs> we've hopefully moved on from. <laughs> well, I'll let you know. No, we haven't because people are not doing anything. I mean, there's people that. Well, that's a different thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... We all know what does it take to be, you know, looking uh, fit and, and or being fit and looking fabulous. Okay, don't smoke, don't drink, don't, you know. Just because we know it doesn't mean we do it. <laughs> Great point. Yeah, <laughs> you drive by the buffet restaurant, you know, people yeah. are out there and sure. you're like, that's not the key. That's not the key, but everyone complains. They're like, oh, I'm not happy. I'm not – be like, well, we, I wrote the book for you. There's 50 different diets. There's, you know, there's all these yeah. different answers here. But I think maybe that also adds to the confusion because if there's so many different ways to cut the marketing cloth, then a lot of people feel happy with whatever scrap of fabric they've kind of – decided is their brand or decided is their marketing. I think a lot of people are in on marketing, but I think a lot of people are resting on the laurels of the legal community that you you kind of discuss is just super transforming because you're not you can't just rely on that because you're a client facing business. I, I, I just, that's just wonderful. So I'm, I'm thinking that the future of law is a little bit cloudy. You know, these old formulas, they're not working even though we're still, you know, um, using them. So kind of going forward into the future, Sylvia, what advice do you have for our audience, our, our lawyers, solos, you know, small firms and stuff? What advice do you have for them about adapting legal practices for the future? That's a good question, and I wish I had a crystal ball, but I guess I'm <laughs> going to offer my uh, my two cents here. Yeah. So, and, um, during the last recession, and I actually quote this in my in my syllabus at uh, uh, at the uh, law school, and I say, um, I got that from a Wall Street Journal article uh, back during the recession. It says, "You're mm -hmm. only as secure as the amount of business you bring in." So, I think that is definitely something uh, people need to keep in mind. And um, someone else had said, excellent firms don't believe in excellence, only in constant improvement, constant change. I think it was Tom Peters. And so really, if, if for those listeners of yours who are law school students, I think they really need to understand what is it that their clients want? 
how can they carve out a niche where they really make themselves really important to the client? And in, in a nutshell, I would say it is helping your client make money, helping them save money and reducing their risk and then treating them well. So if you understand how to to be successful in this way, I do believe that there is still a marketplace. But it might not be in a traditional law firm. It might be that uh, those uh, listeners of yours might start their own uh, new alternative firm or, or mm-hmm. um, have, an, have a, a revolutionary approach. And so I think it's really important in this day and age to not only know how to analyze uh, situations with a legal point of view, but with a business point of view, understanding the business worlds and and really understanding what you're doing in a much wider context. And I believe that if you have that, then it will be less scary and you see opportunities rather than threats everywhere. Well, so so Paul, did you have a question about marketing and advertising? Because... It's pretty, you found that and it's from her paper. <laughs> so I did, Sylvia, we just, we did an episode about TV advertising, lawyers uh-huh. doing TV. Ads. And uh-huh. the one thing that Jake and I talked about that we thought was very important that everybody understand is mm-hmm. that marketing and advertising aren't the same thing. And you yeah. say this oh, in your absolutely. paper, this may be in part due to marketing often having been equated to advertising among lawyers. Um, yeah. it, it, I just think that's a huge point. Um, and I, I, think, I used to have a T-shirt. Uh, marketing is not advertisement, but because people really always confuse it, and it always annoyed me when people said, "Oh yeah, in our industry, people have been doing marketing or being allowed to do marketing since um, was it 1977?" You know the. The Bates versus Arizona State Board board decision, but it's like no, that they allowed advertisement. They didn't allow marketing. Marketing is about understanding what your clients want, need, and expect, and then delivering more than that. And uh, you know, there are many other better definitions of that. But it's not uh, advertisement is a part of marketing, um, but it's just one part, and that's what people really need to understand. I think that definition you just gave is great. So good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I want a t-shirt of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we should do that. Absolutely. Wrapping up, how can people learn more about you, Sylvia? Well, please uh, go to buyinglegal.com uh, for more information on the Buying Legal Council. And so our members are the client side uh, professionals and our friends are the law firms or other providers of legal services. So please become a friend of the Buying Legal Council. You can learn more about what uh, procurement uh, wants and uh, visit our conferences. The North America Conference is on the 5th and 6th of September in New York City. So you definitely need to be there. I hope to see you guys there. 10 questions we ask everyone. 10 questions we ask everyone. Number one, uh, what was the last book you read? I, <laughs> I'm going to laugh about this. I'm reading a book right now. It's called How to Be a Good Tutor. So I was uh, really interested in the, um, you know, Henry VIII to Elizabeth the first period. Well, actually, Henry the seventh. And I heard so. math tutor. I'm, no, I was no, thinking no, the same no, thing. No. I was like, wow, she's still <laughs> looking on how to be no, a good no, teacher. No, That's no. so inspirational. Nice. No. Nice. Tutor. No. Sorry. That's cool. my accent. Tutor. Okay. Number two. What is your best habit? My best habit uh, that I go to the gym every morning. Nice. Number three. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or none of the above? LinkedIn. Okay. Number four. Coffee or tea? Oh, God, I hate coffee. No, definitely tea. Okay. Number five, what is your favorite place? Like a a geographic place in the world? You Mm -hmm. are free to interpret these questions as ever, however you like. Oh, my God. So my cheesy, corny answer will be my yoga mat, but um, um, I don't know. Hiking somewhere, I guess, in nature, somewhere in nature. How about that? That's rolling great. Rolling hills. I like rolling hills. Sure. Sounds good. Perfect. Perfectly acceptable. Number six, is Keanu Reeves a good actor? Oh, my God. I haven't seen a movie with him in a while, so I, I guess so. <laughs> Neither have good. we. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why, why um, Keanu Reeves? Why not? Yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. Never mind. 
it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's just I would a, have it's, expected Meghan Markley or something like that. But, oh um, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll update it. Yeah, yeah it's well. I mean, Keanu Reeves. It seems it, it's drawn a lot of extreme reactions. It's really? kind of it's yeah. It's kind of a strange okay. thing. There's some people oh. who just are straight up haters. It's, it's a cultural okay. flashpoint. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with them. Good. Perfectly neutral. Yeah. Number seven. What was your first job? As a reporter. Cool. Number eight. What is a skill you have outside of your current occupation that you incorporate into your work? I guess that I speak a number of different languages. Number nine. What sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Oh, gosh. I have on Facebook, I, I follow so many different areas. Um, I, honestly, I can't even start to uh, name them all. But I have like a wide variety of topics that interest me from hi historical things to um, uh, to interior design to living healthy to working out, whatnot. So. Nice. Those are my topics. Yep. Social media feed. Yeah, lots of people mm -hmm. do. Um, yeah. Okay, here we go. We've made it to the end. Number 10. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Oh, sounds good. That's what I will do tomorrow. Um, I'll put my my feet up and um, probably fall asleep. No, that sounds really boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, really love, I really love being out in nature and hiking. Um, I used to love clubbing, but I guess those times are over. So I really love to be in nature. There you go. For show notes, links, and info, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or go to www.consultwebs.com slash Lawson Podcast. Be sure to leave us a review and ratings on iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay Lawson. Awesome.